The Pilgrim's Progress, Part One, Chapter Two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part One, Chapter Two. Then did Christian begin to go back to the right road, an evangelist. After he had kissed him, gave him one smile, and bid him Godspeed. So he went on with haste. Neither spake he to any man by the way, nor, if any asked him, would he give them an answer. He went like one that was all the while treading on forbidden ground, and could by no means think himself safe, till again he was got in the way which he had left to follow Mr. Worldly Wiseman's counsel. So, after a time, Christian got up to the gate. Now. Over the gate there was written, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. He knocked, therefore, more than once or twice, saying, May I now enter here? Will he within open to sorry me, though I have been an undeserving rebel? Then shall I not fail to sing his lasting praise on high. At last there came a grave person to the gate named Goodwill, who asked who was there, and whence he came, and what he would have. Here is a poor burdened sinner. I come from the city of destruction, but I am going to Mount Zion, that I may be set free from the wrath to come. I would, therefore, sir, since I am told that by this gate is the way thither, know if you are willing to let me in. I am willing with all my heart, said he, and with that he opened the gate. So, when Christian was stepping in, the other gave him a pull. Then said Christian, What means that? The other told him. A little distance from this gate there is erected a strong castle, of which Beelzebub, the evil one, is the captain. From once both he and they that are with him shoot arrows at those that come up to this gate, if haply they may die before they can enter in. Then said Christian, I rejoice and tremble. So when he was got in, the man at the gate asked him who directed him thither. Evangelist bid me come hither and knock, as I did, and he said that you, sir, would tell me what I must do. An open door is set before thee, and no man can shut it. Now I begin to reap the benefit of the trouble which I have taken. But how is it that you came alone? Because none of my neighbours saw their danger, as I saw mine. Did any of them know you were coming? Yes, my wife and children saw me at the first, and called after me to turn again. Also some of my neighbours stood crying and calling after me to return, but I put my fingers in my ears, and so came on my way. But did none of them follow you, to persuade you to go back? Yes, both obstinate and pliable. But when they saw that they could not prevail, obstinate went railing back, but pliable came with me a little way. But why did he not come through? We indeed came both together, until we came to the slough of despond, into which we also suddenly fell. And then was my neighbour Pliable discouraged, and he would not venture further. Wherefore, getting out again on the side next his own house, he told me I should win the brave country alone for him. So he went on his way, and I came mine, he after obstinate and I to this gate. Then said Goodwill, Alas, poor man! Is the heavenly glory of so little worth with him, that he counteth it not worth running the risk of a few difficulties to obtain it? Truly, said Christian, I have said the truth of Pliable, and if I should also say the truth of myself, it will appear there is not betterment twixt him and myself. Tis true he went on back to his own house, but I also turned aside to go into the way of death, being persuaded thereto by the words of one Mr. Worldly Wiseman. Oh! Did he light upon you? What? He would have had you seek for ease at the hands of Mr. Legality. They are both of them a very cheat. But did you take his counsel? Yes, as far as I durst. I went to find out Mr. Legality, until I thought that the mountain that stands by his house would have fallen upon my head, wherefore there I was forced to stop. That mountain has been the death of many, and will be the death of many more. It is well you escaped being by it dashed in pieces. Why, truly, I do not know what had become of me there had not Evangelist happily met me again, as I was musing in the midst of my dumps. But it was God's mercy that he came to me again, for else I had never come hither. But now I am come, such a one as I am, more fit indeed for death by that mountain than thus to stand talking with my lord. 
but oh what a favour this is to me that yet i am to enter here we make no objections against any notwithstanding all that they have done before they come hither they in no wise are cast out and therefore good christian come a little with me and i will teach thee about the way thou must go look before thee dost thou see this narrow way that is the way thou must go it was cast up by the men of old prophets christ and his apostles and it is as straight as a rule can make it this is the way thou must go but said christian are there no turnings nor windings by which a stranger may lose his way yes there are many ways but down upon this and they are crooked and wide but thus thou mayst distinguish the right from the wrong the right only being straight and narrow then i saw in my dream that christian asked him further if he could not help him off with his burden that was upon his back for as yet he had not got rid thereof nor could he by any means get it off without help he told him as to thy burden be content to bear it until thou comest to the place of deliverance for there it will fall from thy back of itself then christian began to gird up his loins and to turn again to his journey so the other told him that as soon as he was gone some distance from the gate he would come at the house of the interpreter at whose door he should knock and he would show him excellent things then christian took his leave of his friend and again bid him god speed then he went on till he came to the house of the interpreter where he knocked over and over at last one came to the door and asked who was there sir here is a traveller who was bid by a friend of the good man of this house to call here for his benefit i would therefore speak with the master of the house so he called for the master of the house who after a little time came to christian and asked him what he would have sir said christian i am a man that am come from the city of destruction and am going to mount zion and i was told by the man that stands at the gate at the head of this way that if i called here he would show me excellent things such as would be helpful to me on my journey then said the interpreter come in i will show thee that which will be profitable to thee so he commanded his man to light the candle and bid christian follow him so he led him into a private room and bid his man open a door the which when he had done christian saw the picture of a very grave person hung up against the wall and this was the fashion of it it had eyes lifted up to heaven the best of books in its hand the law of truth was written upon its lips the world was behind its back it stood as if it pleaded with men and a crown of gold did hang over his head then said christian what meaneth this the man whose picture this is is one of a thousand he can say in the words of the apostle paul though ye have ten thousand teachers in christ yet have you not many fathers for in christ jesus i have been your father through the gospel and whereas thou seest him with his eyes lifted up to heaven the best of books in his hand and the law of truth writ on his lips it is to show thee that his work is to know and unfold dark things to sinners even as also thou seest him stand as if he pleaded with men and whereas thou seest the world is cast behind him and that a crown hangs over his head that is to show thee that slighting and despising the things that are in the world for the love that he hath for his master's service he is sure in the world that comes next to have glory for his reward now said the interpreter i have shown thee this picture first because the man whose picture this is is the only man whom the lord of the place whither thou art going hath chosen to be thy guide in all difficult places thou mayest meet with in thy way wherefore take good heed to what i have shown thee and bear well in thy mind what thou hast seen lest in thy journey thou meet with some that pretend to lead thee right but their way goes down to death then he took him by the hand and led him into a very large parlour that was full of dust because never swept the which after he had looked at it a little while the interpreter called for a man to sweep now when he began to sweep 
the dust began so abundantly to fly about that Christian had almost therewith been choked. Then said the interpreter to a girl that stood by, Bring hither water and sprinkle the room. The which, when she had done, it was swept and cleansed with ease. Then said Christian, What means this? The interpreter answered, This parlour is the heart of a man that was never made pure by the grace of the gospel. The dust is his sin, and the inward evils that have defiled the whole man. He that began to sweep at first is the law, but she that brought water and did sprinkle it is the gospel. Now whereas thou sawest that, as soon as the first began to sweep, the dust did fly up so about that the room could not by him be cleansed, but that thou wast almost choked therewith, this is to show thee that the law, instead of cleansing the heart, by its working from sin, doth revive, put strength into, and increase it in the soul, even as it doth discover and forbid it, for it doth not give power to overcome. Again, as thou sawest the girl, sprinkle the room with water, upon which it was cleansed with ease. This is to show thee that when the gospel comes, in the sweet and gracious power thereof, to the heart, then I say, even as thou sawest the maiden lay the dust by sprinkling the floor with water, so is sin vanquished and subdued, and the soul made clean through the faith of it, and consequently fit for the king of glory to dwell in. I saw, moreover, in my dream, that the interpreter took him by the hand, and led him into a little room, where sat two little children, each one in his own chair. The name of the eldest was Passion and the name of the other, Patience. Passion seemed to be much discontented, but Patience was very quiet. The Christian asked, What is the reason for the discontent of Passion? The interpreter answered, The governor of them would have him stay for his best things till the beginning of next year, but he will have all now. Patience is willing to wait. Then I saw that one came to Passion and brought him a bag of treasure, and poured it down at his feet, the which he took up and rejoiced therein, and withal laughed patience to scorn. But I beheld but a while, and he had wasted all away, and had nothing left him but rags. Then said Christian to the interpreter, Explain this matter more fully to me. So he said, These two lads are pictures, passion of the men of this world, and patience of the men of that which is to come. For, as here thou seest, passion will have all now, this year, that is to say, in this world, so are the men of this world. They must have all their good things now. They cannot stay till the next year, that is, until the next world, for their portion of good. That proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is of more weight with them than all the words of the Bible of the good of the world to come. But as thou sawest that he had quickly wasted all away, and had presently left him nothing but rags, so it will be with all such men at the end of this world. Then said Christian, Now I see that patience has the best wisdom, and that upon many accounts. One, because he stays for the best things. Two, and also because he will have the glory of his when the other has nothing but rags. Nay, you may add another, this. The glory of the next world will never wear out, but these are suddenly gone. Therefore passion had not much reason to laugh at patience, because he had his good things at first, as patience will have to laugh at passion, because he had his best things last. For first must give place to last, because last must have his time to come, but last gives place to nothing, for there is not another to succeed. He, therefore, that hath his portion first, must needs have a time to spend it. But he that hath his portion last, must have it lastingly. Then I see it is not best to covet things that are now, but to wait for things to come. You say truth, for the things that are seen soon pass away, but the things that are not seen endure forever. Then I saw in my dream that the interpreter took Christian by the hand, and led him into a place where was a fire burning against the wall, and one standing by it, always casting much water upon it to quench it. Yet did the fire burn higher and hotter. Then said Christian, 
What means this? The interpreter answered, This fire is the work of God that is wrought in the heart. He that casts water upon it to extinguish and put it out is the devil. But in that thou seest the fire notwithstanding burn higher and hotter, thou shalt also see the reason of that. So then he led him about to the other side of the wall, for he saw a man with a vessel of oil in his hand, of the which he did also continually cast, but secretly, into the fire. Then said Christian, What means this? The interpreter answered, This is the Christ, who continually, with the oil of his grace, helps the work already begun in the heart, by the means of which notwithstanding what the devil can do, the souls of his people prove gracious still. And in that thou sawest that the man stood behind the wall to keep up the fire, this is to teach thee that it is hard for the tempted to see how this work of grace is kept alive in the soul. I saw also that the interpreter took him again by the hand, and led him into a pleasant place, where was built a stately palace, beautiful to behold, at the sight of which Christian was greatly delighted. He saw also upon the top thereof certain persons walking, who were clothed all in gold. Then said Christian, May we go in thither? Then the interpreter took him, and led him up toward the door of the palace, and behold, at the door stood a great company of men, as desirous to go in, but durst not. There also sat a man at a little distance from the door, at a table-side, with a book and his inkhorn before him to take the name of him that should enter therein. He saw also that in the doorway stood many men in armour to keep it, being resolved to do to the men that would enter what hurt and mischief they could. Now was Christian somewhat in amaze. At last, when every man started back for fear of the armed men, Christian saw a man of a very stout countenance come up to the man that sat there to write, saying, Set down my name, sir. The which, when he had done, he saw the man draw his sword, and put a helmet upon his head, and rush toward the door upon the armed men, who laid upon him with deadly force. But the man, not at all discouraged, fell to cutting and hacking most fiercely, so that, after he had received and given many wounds to those that attempted to keep him out, he cut his way through them all, and pressed forward into the palace, at which there was a pleasant voice heard from those that were within even of those that walked upon the top of the palace, saying, Come in, come in, eternal glory thou shalt win. So he went in, and was clothed in such garments as they. Then Christian smiled, and said, I think verily I know the meaning of this. Now, said Christian, let me go hence. Nay, stay, said the interpreter, until I have showed thee a little more and after that thou shalt go on thy way. So he took him by the hand again, and led him into a very dark room, where there sat a man in an iron cage. Now the man, to look on, seemed very sad. He sat with his eyes looking down to the ground, his hands folded together, and he sighed as if he would break his heart. Then said Christian, What means this? At which the interpreter bid him talk with the man. Then said Christian to the man, What art thou? The man answered, I am what I was not once. What wast thou once? The man said, I was once a fair and flourishing Christian, both in mine own eyes and also in the eyes of others. I was once, as I thought, fair for the celestial city, and had even joy of the thoughts that I should get thither. Well, but what art thou now? I am now a man of despair, and I am shut up in it, as in this iron cage. I cannot get out. Oh, now I cannot. But how camest thou in this condition? I left off to watch and be sober. I gave free reins to sin. I sinned against the light of the word and the goodness of God. I have grieved the spirit, and he is gone. I tempted the devil and he has come to me. I have provoked God to anger, and he has left me. I have so hardened my heart that I cannot turn. Then said Christian to the interpreter, 
but are there no hopes for such a man as this ask him said the interpreter then said christian is there no hope but you must be kept in the iron cage of despair no none at all why the son of the blessed is very pitiful i have crucified him to myself afresh i have despised his person i have despised his holiness i have counted his blood an unholy thing i have shown contempt to the spirit of mercy therefore i have shut myself out of all the promises of god and there now remains to me nothing but threatenings dreadful threatenings fearful threatenings of certain judgment and fiery anger which shall devour me as an enemy for what did you bring yourself into this condition for the desires pleasures and gains of this world in the enjoyment of which i did then promise myself much delight but now every one of those things also bite me and gnaw me like a burning worm but canst thou not now turn again to god god no longer invites me to come to him his word gives me no encouragement to believe yea himself hath shut me up in this iron cage nor can all the men in the world let me out o oh, eternity eternity how shall i grapple with the misery that i must meet with in eternity then said the interpreter to christian let this man's misery be remembered by thee and be an everlasting caution to thee well said christian this is fearful god help me to watch and be sober and to pray that i may shun the cause of this man's misery sir is it not time for me to go on my way now tarry till i show thee one thing more and then thou shalt go on thy way so he took christian by the hand again and led him into a chamber where there was one rising out of bed and as he put on his clothing he shook and trembled then said christian why doth this man thus tremble the interpreter then bid him tell to christian the reason of his so doing so he began and said this night as i was in my sleep i dreamed and behold the heavens grew exceeding black also it thundered and lightened in most fearful manner that it put me into an agony so i looked up in my dream and saw the clouds rack at an unusual rate upon which i heard a great sound of a trumpet and also saw a man sitting upon a cloud attended with the thousands of heaven they were all in flaming fire also the heavens were in a burning flame i heard then a great voice saying arise ye dead and come to judgment and with that the rocks rent the graves opened and the dead that were therein came forth some of them were exceeding glad and looked upward and some thought to hide themselves under the mountains then i saw the man that sat upon the cloud open the book and bid the world draw near yet there was by reason of a fierce flame that issued out and came before him a certain distance betwixt him and them as betwixt the judge and the prisoners at the bar i heard it also called out to them that stood around on the man that sat on the cloud gather together the tares the chaff and stubble and cast them into the burning lake and with that the bottomless pit opened just whereabout i stood out of the mouth of which there came in an abundant manner smoke and coals of fire with hideous noises it was also said to the same persons gather my wheat into the garner and with that i saw many catched up and carried away into the clouds but i was left behind i also sought to hide myself but i could not for the man that sat upon the cloud still kept his eye upon me my sins also came into my mind and my conscience did accuse me on every side upon this i awakened from my sleep but what was it that made you so afraid of this sight why i thought that the day of judgment was come and that i was not ready for it but this affrighted me most that the angels gathered up several and left me behind also the pit of hell opened her mouth just where i stood my conscience too troubled me and as i thought the judge had always his eye upon me showing his anger in his countenance then said the interpreter to christian hast thou considered these things yes and they put me in hope and fear well keep all things so in thy mind that they may be as a goad in thy sides to prick thee forward in the way that thou must go
Then Christian began to gird up his loins, and to address himself to his journey. Then said the interpreter, The Comforter be always with thee, good Christian, to guide thee into the way that leads to the city. So Christian went on his way, saying, here i have seen things rare and profitable things pleasant dreadful things to make me stable in what i have begun to take in hand then let me think on them and understand wherefore they showed me where and let me be thankful o good interpreter to thee End of part one chapter two Thank you for listening and if you like this please subscribe and consider liking my Facebook page and joining my group Jesus Answers Prayer.